Few things in baseball delight more than a dazzling defensive play. Maybe it's a third baseman barehanding a bunt, or a center fielder climbing the outfield wall to rob a home run, or a shortstop making a diving stop up the middle and popping up to throw the runner out, or a right fielder gunning out a runner going for third. The players who can make these plays, and make them repeatedly, live on in our minds and our highlight reels. Brooks Robinson, Ozzie Smith, Ken Griffey Jr., Roberto Clemente, Adrian Beltre, and Dalton Simmons, the list goes on. And then there are the guys on the other end of the spectrum, the ones you pray the ball doesn't find if they're on your team, the ones who really should or should have been full-time designated hitters if it was possible, the players who cost their teams runs game after game with their lackluster defensive play, whether it's because of their stone hands, erratic throws, or the fact they have the effective ground range of an 800-pound sea lion. The history of Major League Baseball is filled with atrocious defenders, but thanks to the improved statistical metrics in today's game, like DWAR, UZR, DRS, and OAA, we have a better sense than ever just how much these guys are costing their teams, and what it really means to be a defensive liability on the ball field. So without further ado, here's our list of the worst fielders in baseball history, and how they distinguish themselves from the competition. With that being said, this list is of course biased towards players from the past few decades, for whom we have better stats and more archival footage chronicling their poor defensive performances. Player number 1, Derek Jeter. No discussion of subpar defensive play would be complete without talking about the defensive profile of one Derek Jeter. And perhaps no topic is more likely to start a brawl in the Bronx. Derek Jeter is one of the best to ever play the game. Full stop. He won 5 Silver Slugger awards, was named to 14 All-Star teams, and in 2011 became just the 28th player to reach the 3,000 hit mark, ending his career with the 6th most hits in Major League history, including the most ever by a shortstop. Jeter was a 5-time World Series champion, a leader in the clubhouse, and a veritable icon in New York. He also may have been the single worst defensive player of all time. Wait, you say, but didn't Captain Clutch win 5 Gold Glove awards? Yes he did. And doesn't he have his own signature defensive move, the Jeter jump throw? Yes he does. And didn't he make some of the most memorable defensive plays in history? How can we forget the flip in the 2001 ALDS, or the header he took into the stands after chasing a pop up in 2004? And sure, Jeter didn't make an excessive number of errors for a shortstop, averaging around 12 per season in his career, but calling a baseball player a good defender because they don't make too many errors is like saying a basketball player is a good defender because they don't commit a lot of fouls. It's just not the whole picture. Bottom line, defense is about preventing the other team from scoring runs. And when you look at Derek Jeter's performance with that in mind, it's an entirely different and far less impressive story. But before we get into that, I want to tell you a little bit about today's sponsor, Underdog Fantasy, and how you can get involved with your favorite teams and players every single day. In any of the major sports, including MLB, NHL, NFL, and NBA. With Underdog's Pick'em, you choose between the over or under on a multitude of daily available stats, ranging from strikeouts, hits, touchdowns, passing yards, even their individualized fantasy points. Then you simply select 2-5 to five picks, and if your picks are correct, you can win anywhere from 3 to 20 times your initial entry amount. Or if those stakes are a little too high for you, you can always go with their insurance system, which allows you to get one pick incorrect in exchange for a lower multiplier. Overall, I think it's a great way to have some fun with your favorite sports, and maybe make a little money while you're doing Doing it. Getting started is simple. Go to underdog.com and sign up with promo code MTC. As of right now, they're matching initial deposits up to $500. Also, make sure to act now if you're interested because this Sunday, Underdog's holding a new customer special where you can select the higher on three different quarterbacks with the number being to beat just 0.5 yards, essentially giving you three different guaranteed wins for your picks. Again, that's underdogfantasy.com with promo code MTC to see them match your initial deposit up to $500. Now, back to our video. Let's start with DRS, or Defensive Runs Saved, which tells you just how many runs better or worse a player has been relative to the average player at his position. Jeter's total DRS is negative 162, the worst of all time, while keeping in mind that the stat didn't even come out until year 8 of his career, meaning he likely would have accumulated far more if it had come out sooner. What's more, he also had two individual seasons that are in the top 10 poorest seasons by that metric. Overall, Jeter is head and shoulders above the second worst retired field Fielder, Prince Fielder with a negative 100 DRS, and the second worst shortstop, Hanley Ramirez, with a negative 74. More on those two in a moment. 
If you look at UZR, Ultimate Zone Rating, you get pretty much the same result. Jeter's rating of negative 66.1 ranks dead last among qualified shortstops. And overall, despite having a career offensive war of 96.3, he also registered a negative 9.4 career defensive war, with just three years where that number wasn't negative. What these numbers primarily reflect is Jeter's complete lack of range, despite playing the position that perhaps demands more than any other. In other words, Jeter spent the entirety of his 20-year career playing one of the game's most demanding positions, despite somewhat obviously sucking at it compared to his peers. Jeter is obviously a better defensive athlete than Prince Fielder, Dave Kingman, and a host of other hit-first players in baseball history, but he should never have been allowed to play shortstop for so long. That fact, more than anything, is why he was able to accumulate such massively negative career defensive totals. But it also reflects how much Jeter was contributing in other ways over those 20 years. As no less than Bill James said of Jeter's defense, unusual weaknesses in sports can only survive in the presence of unusual strengths. The worst defensive shortstop in baseball history would have to be someone like Jeter, who was unusually good at other aspects of the game. Player 2, Gary Sheffield. Speaking of subpar shortstops, let's flash back to the late 1980s and the debut of the Milwaukee Brewers' much heralded 19 year old prospect Gary Sheffield. The Brewers drafted Sheffield as a shortstop and kept him there despite the fact that the teenager committed 87 errors in the minor leagues. You heard that right, 87. Sheffield's bat, however, was just too good to keep down, and so he was the Brewers' opening day shortstop in 1989. Sheffield played 70 games there, committing 12 errors before Milwaukee decided to try him at third base. It didn't really go any better. He committed 25 errors there in 125 games, and those were just on the balls he could get to. By the end of his age 21 season, Sheffield had already racked up a negative 1.2 career D-war. But the Brewers kept Sheffield at third, and so did the Padres and then the Marlins, even as he continued to rack up errors. Sheffield's 1993 season at third is likely one of the worst ever by a major league defender. In 133 games there, Sheffield made 34 errors while fielding 899. That's right, less than 900. His D-war for that season alone was negative 3.0. If advanced statistical metrics had been in place, we can only wonder how historically awful that season would have looked. But Sheffield still had a strong arm and decent athleticism, so the Marlins switched him permanently to right field in 1994. If only the NL had had a DH back then, so much of what followed might have been avoided. It turned out that Sheffield was an unsurprisingly poor outfielder as well. By the end of his career, Sheffield had notched just a 964 fielding percentage and a negative 27.7 D-War, making him the worst defensive outfielder in baseball history. He even managed to run up negative 35 DRS, despite the stat not even existing until over 10 years after his big league debut. Even just run-of-the-mill defensive stats were shocking. Take putouts. As an outfielder, Sheffield made 1.9 putouts per 9 innings. That's about 0.2 less than the league average. In real terms, that means about 32 more baseballs a year dropped in the outfield when Sheffield was out there. That's a lot of singles and doubles instead of outs. On the other side of things, Sheffield, like Jeter, was a major offensive threat. He may even be in the conversation for the most underrated hitter in recent baseball history. After all, Gary was 41% better than the league average hitter by WRC Plus over his career. He had 509 home runs. He stole 253 bases. He finished with more walks than strikeouts. His bat speed was truly otherworldly. Yet, he is not in the Hall of Fame. Part of this is because he was inconsistent throughout his career. He also was tied to PEDs. But a good case can be made that his ungodly awful defense is the biggest factor. Player number three, Prince Fielder. Despite being a first baseman, having a father who was also a professional ball player, and having the last name of Fielder, Prince Fielder distinguished himself as one of the worst defenders to ever play baseball, and at arguably the easiest position on the field. Usually when a father and son both make it to the majors, there's a clear difference between them, and typically, the son is the better player. But Prince Fielder and his father Cecil are that rare father-son tandem that are unusually evenly matched. The Fielders remarkably finished with the same career home run total, their RBI totals were a near match, and their number of 40 and 50 homer seasons were identical. Oh, and they are both horrendous first basemen. Cecil, for his part, despite spending a lot of time at DH for the Detroit Tigers, still managed to rack up a career negative 12.1 D-War in just 13 seasons. 
and young Prince, content to match so many of his father's career offensive numbers, decided to surpass him in at least one regard, defensive futility. In his 12-year career, Prince tallied a negative 20.5 D-War. He also somehow put up negative 100 DRS, the second worst total among retired players after Jeter. This is despite the fact he played about 3,000 less innings than Jeter. His UZR of negative 45.5 is also among the 10 worst of all time. The big bone fielder was limited in his side-to-side -side movement. His arm was erratic, and he was too short to make great stretches at first. He was, to put it bluntly, a defensive liability for all of his three major league teams. And when fielder joined Miguel Cabrera on the Detroit Tigers infield in 2012, it created perhaps the worst defensive corner infield tandem in baseball history. Still, Fielder could flat out hit, and we shouldn't forget that, and his first few seasons were truly historic. Fielder had 230 home runs through age 27. Only three Hall of Fame first basemen, Jimmy Fox, Orlando Cepeda, and Harmon Killebrew ever managed to do that. Player number four, Nick Castellanos. Jeter, Sheffield, and Fielder were all defensive monstrosities, but let's look at a current player who continues to delight and dismay us with his defense, while perhaps existing as the new single worst defender of all time, the Phillies' Nick Castellanos. In just over 8,000 career innings, Castellanos has managed to post the second worst total all time with negative 110 DRS. Remember how I kept making the distinction of retired players before? That's because of Nick. Like Sheffield, he has managed to be this bad at three different positions, right field, left field, and third base. We've already covered Castellanos' defense previously on our second channel, but the sheer hopelessness of it merits further attention in a setting such as this. It's hard to even know where to start. Let's begin where he started third base, a position where he committed 54 errors in just four seasons, posting a 955 fielding percentage. Yeah, not good. Now, let's go back to his jaw-dropping negative 110 DRS. That's worse than Fielder, or Hanley Ramirez. We'll get to him. Or even Jeter, on a per-game basis, of course. It's so bad that the negative 64 Castellanos' tally just in right field would have him ranked 10th worst overall, without even mentioning his negative 45 at the hot corner. And, by the way, he currently is just 31 years old, with 11 big league seasons under his belt. He still has plenty of time to accumulate a lot more. During those 11 seasons, he's managed just a 13.8 B-War, largely due to his jaw-dropping total of negative 12.8 D-War over the same span. So here's a guy who has over 200 career homers and 340 doubles, almost 1,500 hits, not to mention a career 113 OPS+, plus, but it's still sometimes hard to justify putting him out in the field. And when you do, you just have to hold your breath and cross your fingers and hope it works out. Player number five, Hanley Ramirez. As promised, we now come to the defensive ineptitude of perhaps the most controversial player of those presented when they played, Hanley Ramirez. Like some of the other guys we've discussed, Ramirez logged time with a number of teams in his 15-year pro career, and at a number of different positions, including shortstop, third base, first base, and left field. He could also be an offensive juggernaut at times, hitting 271 career home runs with an OPS plus of 124 and a career B-War of 38. All impressive totals, especially when considering his time up the middle with the Marlins. However, like the others, Ramirez was hopeless as a defender, pretty much no matter where you put him. Hanley is currently tied for third worst all time among retired players in DRS with negative 74, and has the fifth worst career UZR mark at negative 53.5. He also, like Jeter, managed to do most of his defensive damage at shortstop, the position on the field that hurts the team most aside from perhaps catcher. Ramirez came up as a shortstop in the Red Sox organization before being traded to the Marlins and promptly winning Rookie of the Year in his first season in 2006. It was not for his defense. He racked up a negative 2.0 D-War in 154 games at shortstop. Ramirez remained a subpar infielder at that critical position for the next decade. It wasn't until 2015 when the Red Sox reacquired him and tried to convert him into a left fielder that Ramirez really took it to the next level of defensive negligence. Clearly the Red Sox underestimated the difficulty of the transition or the magnitude of Hanley's ineptitude at reading fly balls off the monster. This was, to put it lightly, a surprise. Left field at Fenway is famously the smallest in baseball, at about 103,000 square feet, almost 6,000 square feet smaller than the MLB average. Of course, unpredictable bounces off of said monster can make it more challenging, but that should have been no problem for the highly athletic former shortstop. Hanley's left field escapades and misplays quickly became fodder for highlight reels. His throws could also be an adventure. To make matters worse, Ramirez was disturbingly casual in his miscues and dismissive of their importance. He clearly had zero interest in helping the Red Sox defensively. When asked by the press once about a potential move to first base, Ramirez responded with the loud, hell no. He did eventually move to first base, and it turned out he sucked there too in his limited time. 
So that's my personal list of the worst fielders in baseball history, but there are definitely some others worthy of mention, even if I can hardly call it an honorable one. First, who can forget Ryan Braun when he came up as a third baseman with the Brewers in 2007? He made previously mentioned former Brewer Gary Sheffield look like Brooks Robinson. Braun fielded just 895, making 26 errors in 112 games, and made .57 fewer plays per 9 innings than the average third baseman. His deep war for that rookie season? Negative 2.9. The Brewers moved into left field, where things were never that bad again, but never that good either. Braun finished with a career D-War of negative 9.9 in 14 seasons. Let's turn to another Ryan who played in the National League, and who today definitely would have been a DH, Ryan Howard. I'll say this for Howard, he made a big target at first base at 6'4", 250 pounds, but that's about it. His glove work was shoddy, his throwing mechanics were odd, and his reflexes left much to be desired. Yet, playing 13 seasons, all in the National League, there was no other place to put the Giant than first base. The result? A career negative 74 DRS that tied him with Haley Ramirez, and a career D-War of negative 17.3. Finally, we come to Dante Bichette, father of Bo, and a beloved outfielder for the Colorado Rockies. The strong Bichette seemed tailor-made for Coors Field, at least as a hitter. As a fielder, the lumbering Bichette struggled to cover the large outfield, and often flailed in the corner as a ball caromed off the wall and between his legs. Perhaps the craziest number we could point out to detail the ineptitude of Bichette is the fact that despite 274 career homers, he had a B-War of just 5.6 in 14 seasons, largely due to a career D-War of negative 16.2. So there you have it. Had enough of that terrible defense? Perhaps it's time to rinse out the bad taste by watching some Kevin Kiermeyer highlights. Ah, that's better. Now, thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the vid, and click this playlist for other essay videos just like this one.